In this video, I'm going to cover the Python while statement, the entire statement, including the else block, and I'm going to talk about when we use it, some of the pitfalls with it, as well as give some tips on how to rewrite recursive functions as a while loop. The while statement is used for iterating, or rather looping, over the same statements over and over again. If you want to iterate over a sequence, you should use the for statement, and we'll cover that in a later lecture. The while statement looks like the following. While and then some expression that's a condition, and then you either have statements following this on the same line, separated by semicolons, or you indent by four spaces, and you have a block of statements stacked on top of each other. There is an optional else block. Same thing, you can do else with statements separated by semicolons, or indent by four. And of course, after the while statement, you can have more statements in your program. Okay. The effect of the while statement is that it first evaluates the condition. If the condition is true, then it will run the statements inside of the block, the suite. If the condition is false, then it will execute the else statement and then continue with the next statements following the while statement. After it's run an iteration of the block, it will reevaluate the condition. If the condition is still true, then it will execute the block again and then evaluate the condition. If it's still true, it'll run the block again, and so on and so forth, until the condition is false. If the condition is false, then it will run the else block and then continue with the statements following the while statement. There are two kinds of infinite loops in Python and pretty much every program. An infinite loop is a while loop that never terminates. The first kind of infinite loop is intentional. You'll note these because they say things like while, True. True is always true. It's never false. Older versions of Python didn't have booleans, and so you still might see some old programmers say while one. The unintentional infinite loops arise due to a programming error. Typically in this condition, you have some sort of counter that's counting down or up, or you have some sort of condition that is eventually supposed to resolve to false. The reason why you have an unintentional infinite loop is you're forgetting to adjust the variables that are used to input to that condition. So my recommendation is always increment or decrement first. Meaning when you write a while loop, first write the statement that are increment or decrement the variables that affect the condition. Inside of the while block, you can have two statements that you can only run inside of a while or a for loop. The first one is break. Break, when executed, will immediately exit the loop, skip the else statement, and continue with the statements following the while statement. The other command, the other statement, is continue. When the while block hits a continue statement, it stops execution of that block, reevaluates the condition. If that condition is true, it does another iteration. If it is false, it'll run the else block and then continue with the code. Continue is often used to basically short circuit the block. Break is often used to end looping altogether. You can rewrite many recursive functions using a while statement. I'm going to show you how this is done. But first, why should you do this? The reason is, is while statements are a little bit easier to look at, a little bit easier to understand. The only pitfall of while statements is if you have an unintentional infinite loop. These can be quite hard to detect sometimes. Let's rewrite the factorial function as a while statement. The factorial function will take a number in and then multiply that number times a number below that times a number below that all the way down to the number one. In mathematical terms, n factorial is equal to n times n minus one dot 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 times uh, two times one. As a while statement, we'll need some variable to retain the current value as we build it up, and we'll start with one in the result. As long as n is greater than 1, we'll keep multiplying the result by the number n. Don't forget we have to decrement that counter, otherwise we have an infinite loop. Finally, we'll return the result when the while loop completes. Let's analyze this function to see how the while statement works. So there's three cases that I want to look at. One is factorial of one. The other is factorial of, let's say, 
5. We know that factorial of 5 should be 120 and 1 should be 1. Okay? Let's evaluate factorial of 1. When the function is called, the variable n is set to 1. The next statement is assigning result, the value of 1. Then we run the while statement. First we check the condition. Is n greater than 1? No, n is not greater than 1. This statement is false. So we do not execute the loop. We continue with the statement following the while statement. In this case, the statement is return the result. In this case, the result is 1, so it returns 1. This function works properly for that value. Let's see what happens when we call it with factorial 5. So we have n equals 5, because 5 is the parameter for n. Result is equal to 1, while n is greater than 5. Is 5, I'm sorry, n is greater than 1. Is 5 greater than 1? Indeed it is. Result equals result times n. So the result is 1, now we're multiplying by 5, so it's equal to 5. n equals n minus 1, so n is now equal to 4. We reevaluate the condition. Is n greater than 1? The answer is yes it is. 4 is greater than 1. Result equals result times n. So now we're multiplying by 4 and storing that in the result. So now the result is 20. n equals n minus 1, so 4 becomes 3 and for n. While n is greater than 1, is 3 greater than 1? It is. So result equals result times n, so 20 times 3 is 60. n equals n minus 1, so now n is equal to 2. Is n greater than 1? 2 is greater than 1, yes. Result equals result times n, so 60 times 2 is 120. n equals n minus 1, so now n is equal to 1. We evaluate the condition again. Is 1 greater than 1? No, it's not. So we continue with the statement following the while loop. Return result. And indeed, it returns 120. Let's rewrite the recursive Fibonacci as a while loop. This function will find the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence works as follows. The first two terms are 0 and 1, and then every subsequent term is the sum of the previous two terms. So 0, 1, 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 plus 3 is 8, 8 plus 5 is 13, and so on. So this is n equals 0, this is n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. In order to calculate the Fibonacci series, series in this way, we're going to need two variables to track the previous two values. But first, let's see if we have some of these terminating conditions. If n equals 0, we're going to return 0. If n is equal to 1, then we're going to return 1. I'll track the two, twice previous variable in a variable called prev prev, standing for the previous previous. That's going to start off at 0. And then we have prev for the previous value, which is 1. While n is greater than 1. So in this case, n would be 2. And so we're going to add the two numbers together. So result is equal to the previous value plus the previous previous value. The previous previous value will contain the previous value and the previous value will contain the current result. Don't forget to decrement the counter. Finally, when that while statement completes, we can return the result. Let's check out a couple cases of Fibonacci. Let's do Fibonacci of 0, Fibonacci of 1, and Fibonacci of 7. When we call Fibonacci of 0, we execute the function with n equals 0. The first statement compares n with 0. If they're equal, it returns 0. Indeed, n is equal to 0. So the return value for Fibonacci 0 is 0. That works as expected. What about n equals 1? In this case, we compare n with 0. We find that they're different, so we do not execute that branch. Then we compare n with 1. If it's equal, we return 1. In this case, it is equal, so it does return 1. 
finally, let's look at the case of n equals 7. Is n equal to 0? No. Is n equal to 1? No. So prev prev equals 0. And previous equals 1. While n is greater than 1, 7 is greater than 1, the result is going to equal the two values summed together. So result is going to equal 1. 0 plus 1 is 1. Previous plus previous previous. The prev prev is equal to prev, so now that's equal to 1. The previous is equal to the result. That's also equal to 1. Nothing changes there. And then we decrement the counter. Then we evaluate the condition again. Is n greater than 1? It is. So the result is equal to the sum of the two previous values. So 1 plus 1 is 2. Previous previous equals previous. So that's 1. Previous equals result. That becomes 2. n equals n minus 1. That becomes 5. We check it again. It is greater than 1. Result equals prev prev plus prev. So that's 3. Prev prev equals prev. So that becomes 2. Previous equals the result. That becomes 3. n equals n minus 1. Now we're at 4. Is n greater than 1? It is. Result equals these two values added together. That's 5. Prev, prev becomes prev. The previous becomes a result. n equals n minus 1. Evaluate it again. Result equals prev plus prev, prev. So that becomes 8. I'm sorry, I should write it out that way. Prev, prev becomes prev. So that becomes 5. Previous becomes a result. That becomes 8. n equals n minus 1 down, down to 2. Is n greater than 1? It is. Result equals prev, prev plus prev. So 5 plus 8 is 13. Prev, prev equals prev. So this becomes 8. The previous becomes a result. That's 13. n equals n minus 1. So that's 1. Is n greater than 1? No, it's not. It's equal. So then we return the result. In this case, we return 13, which is the value we were looking for. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, the while statement really isn't that complicated. Um, there's not a lot of cases I can think of when we use the else condition. The only cases that I can really think of is when you're iterating through a sequence using an, a counter or something like that, which I strongly recommend not doing that. There is ways to do this with for loops, and there's some functions that make it a little bit easier to, to iterate through a sequence and maintain the counter, particularly the enumerate function, which we will talk about when we talk about enumeration. So, this should open up um, basically with the if statement, with functions, and with while. You have all the basic components you need to write almost any sort of program. Everything else you're going to learn in Python from here on out is basically icing on the cake to make your life a little easier, a little better. So with that, take care. Find me on Discord. If you'd like to support the channel, you can support me through Patreon. Have a great day. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you for watching this video on the theory of Python by Real Physics. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. Like and share this video. You can find me on Discord or support me on Patreon. Links are in the description below. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.